it means a lot to me to be considered a New Orleans musician after 20 years of being here. To be thought of as one of the elders in New Orleans music. Good evening to everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Melinda Valentini. I was a longtime dear and close friend of Lauren's. And on behalf of all of his friends and family, thank you so much for being here to celebrate <laughs> the incredibly extraordinary man that Lauren is. I may refer to him in the present tense as we go through our Love Fest program, not because I have any confusion about the fact that he's transitioned, but because he is very much alive and in my heart and will be for eternity. Okay. In Lauren's own words, welcome to Hotel Earth. You don't choose when you check in or out, but you get to choose what you do while you're here. This is one of the most beautiful and impactful things that Lauren ever taught me. You always have choice. And the thing about choice is that you have to choose. If you don't choose, choices get made for you, and that is not what you want. Don't be fearful of choosing wrong, just choose. If you don't like the choice you made, choose again, and just keep choosing. This has allowed me in my life the freedom to create it in any way that I could conceive. In giving me this gift of creation, Lauren taught me to fearlessly pursue life and embrace it, to run headlong into being alive, and really love it and hold it with reverence and joy. Lauren and I, in this incarnation, were friends for 25 inspiring years, and like so many of you here today and beyond, he helped to profoundly shape the trajectory, the trajectory of my life. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Okay, great. If anyone can't hear me, just throw an ear and I'll make sure that I'm getting connected with the microphone. Okay, thank you, Sheila. We met when I was young, in my early 20s. He was playing music at the 201 restaurant on Decatur Street, and I waited tables there. Hi, I'm Lauren. Hi, I'm Melinda. Bam, lifelong friends. He saw both the truth of my nature as well as the person that I would become. He held space for our friendship, where I always felt safe, seen, heard, and challenged to think in new ways that helped me grow into the person that I am today. He gave me the absolute best gift that you can give a young person entering adulthood, a no bullshit card. <laughs> Inauthentic, no thanks. Selfish, nope, I'll keep moving on. Not very interesting, I'll pass thanks. I'm still working to perfect the use of my no bullshit card, but I'm getting better every day. <laughs> Lauren told me once that his favorite place to stay updated on current events was the National Enquirer. <laughs> he truly felt that they had the most accurate knowledge on what was happening in the world and in the same breath he would tell me I believe everything and I believe nothing he wasn't afraid of ideas and he loved thinking big and digging into a discussion I really loved to listen to him talk Lauren was wonderful amazing and inspiring a true renaissance man a musician, writer, and artist, and a cook. In the words of Sheila, his music was poetry, his poetry was music. The harmony in his music was the harmony of his life. His personality was funny, intelligent, warm. He was curious about everything and could turn everything into something interesting. And that is the truth. He was a loving father and partner and a prolific creator. His existence is a gift in my life that I am thankful and grateful for. As I approach the age that he was when we first met, I hope that I have the chance to impact someone so positively and significantly as he did with me. So as we move through our program, oh, it's fine, yeah. As, Okay, so as we move through the program, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna touch on a couple of subjects that I feel like were central to Lauren's existence. They were his true north and made him who he was. And they're gonna be fun and they're gonna be poignant and some of them are from his journals and quotes from other people. So, it's, so we're really, really loving, loving, loving and celebrating him. The first one 
New Orleans. This is from his journal. Friday, June 14th, 1996. The Intercontinental Hotel, St. Charles Avenue. That first night I arrived up in the rooming house on Canal, thick heat, old dry oaks, end of the long journey back from Europe. I wondered, why have I come to this strange city? The answer, to hear music singing in the streets, to ride with Edward Frank past the ornate old theater on Canal, where he heard Stan Kitten from the alley because there wasn't even a balcony for the colored in those days, to play over and over the notes, the songs, I don't know how to pronounce this word, the polyphony. 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 polyphony, I figured we would have someone in here. Is that a music term? Yes. yes. Please, now you know, I'm not a music friend. <laughs> the polyphony of New Orleans, to walk with Paul, pushing his bass down Ursuline in the rain, to play Gloryland with John Boutte, for Luke's coming to learn to make those bass, those bass lines stomp, to walk dusky streets down in Brazil, Sao Paulo, to hang in the darkness of Molly's in the mornings, to go through dusty old National Geographic's in the used bookstore on Royal, now long gone, to find that sweet-eyed Indiana farm girl who's become my inseparable companion. Let's try that one more time. <laughs> to find the sweet-eyed Indiana farm girl who's become my inseparable companion? Why ask? There are a thousand answers, voices, scenes, music played, feelings felt, hellos and goodbyes. Please forgive me, this is gonna be the worst Portuguese pronunciation you've ever heard. Encontros e despedidi? Any, any, okay, I can spell it for you if you need me to. I came here to lead my life, New Orleans, Louisiana. Yeah, you right. Yeah, you're right. That uh, translation means greetings and hellos, and I think it's a Wayne Shorter song as well. With that, I would like to welcome Joel Pickford, Lauren's brother, to the microphone. I got a quick story about uh, doing working with Lauren in the recording studio doing a film score. Uh, writing and performing music for a film score is an exacting and challenging process. In 1999, I asked Lauren to score Master of Light, a documentary about our father and his life as a watercolor artist. Come on, get it together. Once I'd finished the picture and dialogue cut, I sent Lauren a video and a list of the in and out points for musical cues. We talked at length by phone. Lauren had lots of ideas and began working immediately. Many film composers, even some very famous ones, sometimes take the easy way out and just kind of vamp their way through the cues they've been assigned. I've seen a big budget movie by Robert De Niro in which a well-known composer, who I won't name, created a score by simply paying a bunch of familiar New Orleans R&B grooves on Hammond organ and calling it a day. And that was a big budget film. In spite of our modest budget, Lauren took the high road and wrote original compositions for most of the cues in the film. He flew to Fresno for a recording session with multiple instruments in tow. Several of Lauren's compositions required a string quartet, so we hired three players from the local symphony and brought in virtuoso cellist Eugene Friesen from Connecticut, formerly with the Paul Winter Consort. I will never forget that day in the recording studio with Lauren. It was one of the most <clears throat> productive and rewarding days of creative collaboration I've ever experienced. Over the course of the day, Lauren performed on Chinese wood flutes, the Armenian oud, piano, and sea flute. His compositions were as rich and emotional as they were varied, reflecting the specific qualities of each scene and his love for our father. Eugene Friesen improvised brilliantly on several of Lauren's compositions without rehearsal. One composition, The Persimmon Tree, seemed to me to be an autobiographical memoir of Lauren's childhood. <clears throat> its wistful melody swirls through the film as our father paints the fall colors <clears throat> on a tree that he had planted some 50 years earlier. Besides recording The Persimmon Tree for the film, Lauren took the time to write it out by hand in his incredibly beautiful musical notation. 
at the end of a 12 hour day in the studio, we had completed some 40 minutes of music for the film, an incredible amount for the limited time and budget we had. Later, while editing and mixing the film, I heard Lauren's musical cues dozens of times over without ever tiring of them. I've been criticized for mixing the music too loud in the film soundtrack. I did it because I came to understand music as more than just background. It can be a major component of filmmaking as important as cinematography or lighting. <clears throat> I learned that and so much more about music from my big brother, Lauren. And, um, if we, if we got a band here, the first great blues artist I know of that Lauren played with was T-Bone Walker. And in the early 1970s, and within probably the last year of T-Bone Walker's life, um, Lauren was a regular member of his band, went over to his house, had great stories to tell. Um, T-Bone Walker, for those of you who don't know, was to the electric guitar and the modern blues what Charlie Parker was to the alto saxophone and modern jazz. So if, if we got a rhythm section here, we're going to play T-Bone Shuffle by T-Bone Walker. Is it, is it okay to mix music with the testimonials? Okay. <laughs> Piano? Nobody on piano. <laughs>
thing Have fun while you can Time don't mean a thing You can't tell what might happen That's why I love to sing You can take it with you That's one thing for sure You can take it with you that's one thing for sure You ain't got nothing that a good T-bone shuffle won't cure Joel, thank you so much. And we have Charlie Miller on piano, Peter Harris on bass, and Herman LeBeau on drums. Thank you, gentlemen. Herman LeBeau. Did I say that right? Yes, sir. Yes, I did. OK. <laughs> OK. Thank you so much, you guys. The second subject that I would love to touch on briefly is hilarity. Lauren loved an absolutely irreverent joke. He held everything sacred and nothing sacred at the same time. So I have two quick things I'm gonna read you. One is from a letter and then the other is um, a conversation with Sheila. Hi Melinda, thank you for your letter. I just got back from my week in California which I will tell you all about, but I am so excited reading your letter and need to tell you that in my interpretive Egyptian dance routine, I have unfortunately replaced bananas with whole boiled potatoes, and they're a tough job for the chopsticks. It's just that the bananas make it seem, well, so monkey-like, and God knows it's hard enough preserving dignity while wearing those damn lime green lederhosen and the bozo wig, not to mention the cursed Groucho Marx nose on my glasses. But one must preserve historical accuracy. <laughs> Okay, and then this is a conversation between Lauren and Sheila. Lauren, hey, who made this pumpkin pie? Sheila, I picked it up at Whole Foods. Lauren, it tastes like it was made by AI. Those alcoholic hippie boys up there can really cook. <laughs> Please welcome Melissa Pickford, Lauren's sister, to read Jeff Pickford's memories. <laughs> So our older brother Jeff couldn't be here today. He lives in California. These are his words, not mine. And um, because he's the first person who ever knew Lauren. And when you hear his words, and I say the name Jimmy, you should know that's Lauren. That's what he was born. He was born named James. And he was Jimmy for many years and didn't become Lauren until he was an adult. Jeff calls this the beginning. This is the story of two young boys, brothers, both born in Fresno, California. Jeff was the oldest, Jimmy was the youngest. They lived in a small Tudor-style house with their parents, Rollin and Gladys. Everything was wonderful until it wasn't. Their parents divorced when they were five and three, respectively. Their mother left them, claiming she wasn't able to take care of them. They went with their father and lived with their grandparents for two years. Their father eventually remarried. Their new stepmother, Glenna, was wonderful and did the best she could to raise them, but some damage had been done by their mother's absence. These two brothers were best friends. They did everything together. They shared a bedroom with bunk beds. They were outside kids and loved to do anything that involved dirt, sand, grass, or water. They both had vivid imaginations and invented lots of games and adventures. Some of the more significant adventures are easy to remember, even after 70 plus years. At an old cemetery in Hornitos, bad guys and good guys, Jimmy became the notorious bandit Joaquin Marietta and Jeff was the sheriff. 
They spent an entire afternoon trying to shoot each other while running and hiding among and behind the gravestones. Joaquin Marietta was never apprehended or jailed. <laughs> In the football stadium on the field at Stanford University, Jimmy was the 49ers' Hugh McKinley, Mc, Mc, McElhenney, and Jeff was the defense trying to stop him from making a touchdown. Jimmy was way too fast and shifty to be stopped. He scored quickly and often. They both loved boxing and would listen to the Gillette Friday night fights with their grandfather. One day, they put on their father's boxing gloves and went to their grandparents' backyard to stage the World Heavyweight Championship. Jimmy was Joe Lewis, and Jeff was Rocky Marciano. Joe won by a knockout. Rocky, now Jeff, lay flat on the lawn, stunned by a punch to the jaw by Joe, now Jimmy. Their grandmother was watching from the kitchen window and panicked. She ran to the yard, sure that Jeff had been killed. These are just some of the games and adventures Jeff and Jimmy played together. There was always something fun to do to have fun with each other. In Pacific Grove, at the coast, they once got stranded on the rocks by high tide. They jumped off rock lodges 20 feet above the water into the Smith River. They fished together at Shaver Lake and Lake Earl. They tried to catch landlocked salmon by hand in the deep pools of the Smith River. They dived and rolled down huge sand dunes in Monterey. They took English horse riding lessons together. They stalked bulls with their BB guns at Fort Dick and swiped their mother's cigarettes and smoked them in an old lumber mill across the street. <laughs> they found their uncle's Playboy magazines in his old truck in Red Bluff. <laughs> These are just a few of the adventures they had as kids that helped build a lifetime unbreakable bond between brothers. After high school, their lives took very different paths. Jimmy became Lauren and began his long and distinguished career in the music world. The bond, however, remained. Even though they were separated by miles and different careers, they kept in touch. Sometimes there were long time spans between contacts, but they were always aware of what the other was doing. When they connected and spent hours talking about their childhood adventures and getting caught up on each other's families and lives, that was time spent reminiscing and remembering the childhood that they had shared. I've written this narrative in the third person to avoid the use of I and me, because it's about, it's about Lauren's life. I'm happy that I got to hear Lauren perform several times over the years, and I can remember each performance vividly. He once got the band to sing happy birthday to me at the DBA club here in New Orleans. Logically, I know that advancing age brings us all closer to the end of life in this realm, but I still miss him terribly. I'm very proud of Lauren and the beauty that he brought into the world through music and art. I miss and love you, bro. When it's my time to go to the next world, I want your beautiful song, Evocation of the River Spirits, to be played as I make the transition. Our third subject that was so central to Lauren's existence is music. When Lauren passed, Sheila had an outpouring of love from those whose lives he had touched. They fell into several themes, one of which was music. Theme two, Lauren Pickford taught me everything I needed to know about music, how to be a musician, and about how to be a man. These are some of the quotes that she collected. I learned more about music on the bandstand than I did with any other musician. How to improvise, listen and respond, how to tell a story with the music, and how to advance my harmonic knowledge. I learned more about music in the classroom from Lauren than any other teacher. If I didn't understand something, we'd meet at a cafe and we'd talk about it until I really understood. I still use stuff Lauren taught me to this day. Lauren actually had a booth at one restaurant that had a plaque with his name on it, Professor Pickford. <laughs> wow. Lauren helped me see how a musician could survive in the world, how to get gigs, how to record, that every good musician needed to know how to cook. He, he taught me how to be a good human 
by being a good human himself. Please welcome John Boutte, a dear friend of Lauren's and a longtime musical colleague. I won't. <laughs> surprise. Well, surprise. I didn't really prepare anything. I was just walking Betty Shirley back to her car. You know, I was a Boy Scout a long time ago. I love Lauren, by the way. That Lauren was just, I got so many stories, you guys would never get out of here. So, but all I can tell you is the first time I saw him was on, I think it was Esplanade in Decatur. And uh, I was looking for a piano player. And he said, I'm a piano player. And he was, he played great piano. I didn't even know he played uh, alto saxophone for so many years, man. But Lauren was a good man. He was a, he was a intellect for sure and a true artist. Like uh, you said earlier, man, he could cook. He could, he could uh, play music. He was incredible artist, like his father, who was, I think, the uh, artist lawyer of California in his 90s. But, uh, and he played with me till he couldn't play that horn anymore, you know? He was always worried about, you know, his teeth and the reeds and, but he, he was an incredible player. And he was on the foot of Canal Street. He was on, on my major recordings, man, that, uh, Push my career. So, I don't know what I should do. But, uh, sing us a song. Sing us a song. Oh, I guess I can sing. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Put your hands together for Noble Master Osaki, man. Noble place. Both Noble and Peter played uh, along me and Lauren for uh, a long time, man. It's in, it's in B flat. I'm sure you show it. Don't waste your time being angry Where the moment is better with a smile And if you feel your time has been wasted Waste it down here for a while Standing at that bus stop Just across from Cross I was waiting, waiting for the driver to take me to his heavenly house. I see you there at the foot of the canal street. Or what will they wear at the foot of the canal street? Will the band be playing at the foot of the canal And what will the people be saying at the foot of the canal street? Does your father lie there? Does your mama pray for you? Overflowing, the streetcar has his day. When all is gone, the plantation, the trim and the vuca ray. I'll be swinging to the music way, way, way up on higher ground. Where pops is blowing, walk on the Lord, making sacred sounds. I'll see you there. Oh Lord, what will they wear? And will the band be playing? What will people be saying? Will the people be saying? Hey, does your father lie? Does your mama pray? Will the people be saying? 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 Will the people be saying?
John, that was absolutely wonderful. I'm not sure how John does that every single time, but as soon as he opens his mouth, it is waterworks for me. Even when it's something just as joyful as at the foot of Canal Street. Just waterworks. <laughs> okay, when Lauren transitioned, I had a profound conversation with Sheila that perhaps the reason we are all here is to interact with, truly see, and love other people. 
if that's the whole purpose of our existence and is in fact the case, Lauren's life was abundant beyond measure. Theme one of quotes and out, an outpouring of love that Sheila collected on Facebook, Lauren Pickford saved my life. My girlfriend, boyfriend, wife, husband left me and I was nearly suicidal. Lauren stayed with me for days and days until he knew I was all right. He put it into a perspective that made me think about it in a different way where I wasn't the victim of this sad affair, but someone who made choices and that I could continue to make choices for my whole life, it gave me hope. Lauren Pickford saved my life. I just arrived in town after leaving an abusive relationship, had no money, job, or place to live. I ran into Lauren and within two hours, I had a job, some money, and a place to live all because of him. Please welcome Danny Robinson, Lauren's longtime friend, to share his words of love for Lauren. Hey, y'all. John, did, John, didn't you say at the Bywater gig yesterday, don't, don't make me cry and then expect me to sing? <laughs> don't make me cry and then expect me to talk, man. Um, I'm an old friend of Lauren's. Um, met him in Fresno, California in 1989. And uh, I know some of you from Fresno are here and made the trip, and that's so beautiful. Um, I had the good fortune to unexpectedly end up in Fresno um, and dropped into what was then a, a, a beautiful art scene in the Tower District. Um, I didn't know it at the time. I just found a studio apartment that happened to be across the parking lot from Butterfields where Lauren held court every Saturday night with his childhood friend Don Weed and I'm telling you the two of them together Lauren was in his mid-40s then and at his absolute zenith <laughs> and those guys would just as I've said to Sheila peel your skin back on your face every Saturday night and that's when I learned how to love jazz music and Lauren taught me, um, oh, and they also had a, the breakfast gig uh, the next morning, the brunch gig, so we'd get four hours of him Saturday night, I'd go home and sleep a little while and come back for his brunch gig on Sunday mornings and got a weekend full of it. Um, but I guess, you know, I had aspirations to write some beautiful tribute poem. <laughs> and realized that really what I wanted to do was just talk about my friend because Lauren needs to be talked about. Um, he's the most unique creative force that I've ever met. Uh, there just wasn't and will never be anyone like him. Um, ever. Yeah, you're right. So, like everybody in this room, I could tell you a thousand stories about the times I spent with Lauren and um, sitting in the chicken pie shop and drinking coffee for seven hours and filling my pockets with creamers because I was so broke I couldn't buy milk for cereal, you know. <laughs> but he always had a lot to say um, through his horn and in conversation. And he was so generous. Um, he was just such a generous, Soul. At that time, he was teaching music at Fresno City College, and we'd go down to the Olive Tower Cafe, and he'd have a table full of 20-something students that were just rap. Tell us another story, Lauren. You know, and he was just he was just ego-free and generous. And everybody in this room knows that. Um, people across the world know that. The souls he touched. The musicians he brought along, um, he just loved generously, and um, that was his life. So I guess I just want to, I've been thinking about legacy, you know, we all do when we get a little older, what's our life been about? And I, I think that, you know, in Lauren's case, I mean, this room is testament to his legacy. Uh, certainly his music around the world, his recordings, the people he touched, the musicians he played with. But I think, you know, for me anyway, above it all is just that he 
touched people. He was there for people. We've heard stories about people he lifted up. He was present. He was generous. And um, he was my big brother for a lot of years. And you know, there's this, there's this saying that death is only tragic for the living, right? So I think Sheila and I have talked a lot over the last few months about him just simply moving on to his next gig, which I, I truly believe is what he's doing. And he gets to play with Todd Duke again, and Eric Traub, and George Rossler, and all these guys that went before him. And I just, my healing thing has been thinking about him and what they're doing. And I truly, I mean, shit, maybe Miles Davis is sitting in, I don't know. <laughs> but um, the thing that I will always carry with me is that Lauren spent 78 years putting beauty into the world. And that's his legacy. And, and the love that is here tonight uh, is a celebration of that beauty that he spent his entire life putting into the world. And uh, that's, a, that's a life well lived in my so, thank you. Danny, thank you so much. That was beautiful. The fourth subject that I feel like shaped Lauren's life significantly was spirituality. And I want to read a small excerpt from a letter. I'll figure this out before we're done. <laughs> you wrote of the jumbled feeling in comparing your path with those of others. Yeah, I empathize, empathize. We are all waves in an ocean. Why one wave is this size or another? Remember, we all return to the same source. Our life, our paths, our art, our musics are the bridges back to the source. And though the seas and currents are stormy, all paths lead back to our source in the eternal heart of the creator. Please welcome Wendell Brunius, Lauren's longtime friend and musical colleague, and his granddaughter, Teresa Farrell. You want to say something? No. No? I'm not ready to sing. No. Okay. I'll just cry. It'll be weird. Yeah. You know, uh, Lauren is one of the, the great people that God put on earth. In 2005, we had a, a big hurricane here and we all got evacuated out of here and how we got back here, that's a, that's a whole volume of books. And um, my story about coming back here, I saw Lauren and he was like, man, I have this apartment upstairs on, you know, on Magazine Street, you can come hang with me up there. So, I mean, that kind of got me back to my hometown, Lauren. I had first met him, I don't know what year it was, but it was in the early days of Frenchman Street. And he was playing on Frenchman Street with uh, Leroy Jones, Edward Frank, you remember that gig? I remember Leroy Jones. Yeah, and I listened to Lauren play and I was like, man, who's hearing like that? Because I heard all kind of like Eric Dolphy and, and Charlie Parker kind of mixed together. And, and I, then I felt obligated to talk to him. We became instant friends. And a little later on, I brought him to Brazil with me on piano. But he brought his saxophone, of course. And who walks up to the stage but Joe Sample? Wow. And Joe Sample said, I knew when they told me they had a, a bad word. Joe Sample had a mouth like a toilet. The ML from New Orleans, I knew it was you. He said, no, I'm not going to ask you if I can sit in. I'm coming to sit in. 
So I told Lauren, I said, get, get your alto, man. Come on, let, this, let him sit in. So we played the whole night with Joe Sample playing piano with us. Anyway, that's, I heard someone mention that thing. It was Who just, was that trombone player with the blonde, long hair, like down to here, that I used to play with Leroy? Is that what we were doing? Oh, oh Craig, Craig, Craig Klein, Klein, yeah. And he had, I, I was 12, the first time I saw, I think I remember you. But I was just a kid, and that was one of the first live jazz experiences I ever had. Fantastic, you know, <laughs> it's, it's that stuff you can't make up, you know. But anyway, a while ago, a month ago or so, um, Sheila called me, and the, it was Lauren's number, and I picked up the phone immediately. Hey, Lauren, how you doing, man? You know, and then she had to oh, tell me this bad news, and it was very, very upsetting, but. I knew Lauren had done his work here. He had touched everybody in a very positive manner. And I just thank God that I was, I knew him. Because he presented so many positive things to everybody that he was around. And we go out and have breakfast and just, he would hold court, him and every child, man. Those two guys, you couldn't get a word in edgewise, let me tell you. They would just hold court, man, they, you know, man. They would, I mean, you know, it just was, but it's the days I treasure now, because anyway, but God bless you, Lauren. You know, they, I remember Jimmy Durante used to have a saying, some of us old enough to remember that. And he'd say, I think it might have been his mother, and he'd say, good night, Mrs. Calabash. Wherever you are. I want to say good night, Lauren Pickford. We know where you are, brother. Thank you. You want to tell them what you're going to do? Okay. Come on, come on. All right. I, I think Wendell's going to play a Charlie Parker jam that meant a lot to my grandpa. And I'm going to put take apart grandpa's saxophone and lay it to rest in his case for maybe the last time. Yes. Lauren had so much respect for Charlie Parker, and we're going to do this song. I'll provide. Would you help me? One, two. Mm -mm -mm.
Thank you so much, Wendell and Teresa. Please welcome Chris Mann to read a poem of Lauren's. Most of the people who have been speaking here are all contemporaries of Lauren, but he was also, no, it was like a, it's like a huge train of young people like, uh, of, there was a huge like train of young people like myself that he all mentored in different ways. You know, there's, you know, like, I mean, years of it. Um, I love Lauren. I love Lauren enough that I listened to hundreds of hours of conspiracy talk of, <laughs> of the Art Bell late night AM. This, this expert from NASA says this is what's really happening. And there's a lot of cigarettes and coffee and kept coming back. So this is a, this is a poem that he wrote about second lines. Where did they go? Into a more incredible plane of existence, full of light? I used to feel like I knew. I was younger then. We seek anchors to this life, ways to pretend that old brother death ain't waiting for us. The artist comes to know the abyss. He comes to desire it as he takes the leap over and over. He takes solace in mythology. But it ceases to quell when death or destruction moves in too close. Then he begins counting breaths, savoring, seeking angels, the neural seeking angels. The New Orleans way is to celebrate life. When you die, they'll dance and parade you out to some more trumpet, clarinet, bone, polyphony, as I've learned tonight. <laughs> Send you off and lay you down to the one last party the street beat. Thank you. Yeah. Chris, thank you so much. I can't tell you what an honor it's been to share and hold space with each of you this evening. Lauren is truly an absolutely magnificent human, and I'm so much better for having had his friendship and his love. We just have one big round of applause and some hoops and hollers for Lauren. Okay, so I am welcoming now Siva Vinay to the stage, and they are going to initiate our second line. A big thank you to Sean Stollard for hosting our Love Fest this evening. <laughs> and for those of you that are interested, when we return from the second line, you, I think, Sheila, this is right, the mic is gonna be open, and if there's anything that anyone would like to say, I think it's a uh, free game at that point. Okay. Thanks. Well, for an instrument, we want to join in. Please, now is the time. We're gonna do a little Paul Bob Moran second line. Come on. We're gonna go out. Thank you. 
one of the best solos of my life and just have a big, huge fucking cardiac. Speaking, I always told Pete Harris, the bass player, that. I said, Peter, when I die, it's going to be of a cardiac, and I'm going to land right on your bass and bring it to the floor and crush it. I promise you I'm going to do that. So on gigs, sometimes I'll fake a heart attack. I go, uh, 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 and I like to watch Pete because he goes, <laughs>